And welcome to the July 17th meeting of the Rotary Club of Raleigh, and welcome to your guests. Um, hello, everybody on Zoom. Thank you for joining. It's a pleasure to be here today for our second meeting in our wonderful new location. Uh, please follow us on all of our social media Facebook. We are on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And again, thank you to Tobacco Road. This is a fantastic location. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, who used the parking vouchers last week? Okay. Three hours or less. What you need to do on the way out, you scan the credit card on the way in probably. So what you need to do on the way out is choose the scan barcode options, scan your credit card, and then you scan the barcode that you can pick up on a split on the desk on the way out. So um, enjoy, make sure you get plenty of food. Um, it looks great. The heat is for thing. But before we move on, uh, Tommy, you can do an invitation and pledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You all for being here today on the Protarians or on the Timmons. Can you bow your heads? Father, thank you for bringing us all here today. For all of us gathering together as brothers and sisters of Rotary, committed to the work that this organization has come together to accomplish. Help us to remember those who are not with us who might be outside in the seat, whether they be working today or whether they be homeless and don't have a place to be and they're stuck in this kind of heat. We ask that we would uh, remain responsive and work together for those kinds of uh, folks and lend a hand the opportunity to rise as fast as we would all be receptive to be instruments of your work out in the field so that we can help people to have better lives and to do that in your name and your Thank you for the food today and for the gathering and the speaker that's here with us today. Amen. 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 Thank you. No, we pledge allegiance. Okay, don't forget the red box in the middle of the table. Um, spare change, um, dollar bills you have, please throw those in the buckets. Those go to that, those money to go to benefit the Dementia Alliance in North Carolina. So, all that money stays local. And it is for a great cause, and it really helps people that are struggling with dementia, Alzheimer's, and those horrible diseases. So I got last week um, to um, introduce guests. So <laughs> going to do that today, starting with um, Mr. Stocker, and Mr. Paul Stocker. If you could stand up and just wave everybody, my wonderful husband. And we'll get back to the speed. And then we also have another very special guest who's the wife of our speaker today. Ariel, if you could stand up and introduce yourself. Yeah. 
And um, Charlie, you know, Charlie, bring a new happy dollars. And this time, this is pretty much like Lawrence is going to pass around the microphone. So please speak up, bring into the microphone so we can all hear your happy dollars. I have moved up. I have the same honor to receive the Elizabeth Governor first ever Women's Innovation Award a week and a half ago. So, this is a big honor. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I've got a happy moment. Um, it's for Wimbledon. You all watched the men's final yesterday, and I've called it. I heard him yell from downstairs because he was watching it. Uh, he only won this year. He beat Joe Kovic, and it was apparently a very amazing game in Washington place. So, dollar for Wimbledon. So, Rotary Trivia. We started this last week. Um, he doesn't love Rotary Trivia, and we did. Um, uh, the first Rotary Club ever charter was in UNC Charlotte. So that's really fun that worldwide um, Rotary actors um, started right here in North Carolina. So today's Rotary trivia question is what was the first Rotary service project? And y'all in the new room. <laughs> and then Patty knows, and y'all who went to the new members orientation should also know this. So if anybody want to shout out what it was. Thank you. Who was it, Nathan? Backwards. However, I really like how they described this. They called it in 1907, Paul Percy Harris, the founder of Right Wage, did their first service project um, in constructing or creating public comfort centers. And that is just put the night flight way into like public playlists. So that was the first Rotary project. Upcoming meeting. So next meeting, we have our very good James Lamacha. He's going to talk about Gift of Life International, which provides heart saving surgery to kids around the world. The next week, on Monday the 31st, we have Michael Bustle from NC State, and he is the director of the NC State's Global Training Initiative. Um, and that does course work all over the world. They bring um, students here, um, international students here, and they also send professors out to countries all over the world. Um, after that, we have Andy Brent Musafi from Creative, uh, Great Story Creative, and she's going to tell you how storytelling can be used in your marketing and branding. So that'll be a very formative great meeting. And then we're going to continue the tradition that Tom Packer started last year, past president Tom Packer, of a midsummer break. That's a uh, week that a lot of schools start back. So we're going to take a little, um, little break that week. We still have some great service projects coming up um, all throughout August. So I'm going to keep your eye out. Those originally be up in a little bit to talk about them. So um, you'll see again, there are some cards on the table. Um, please feel free to take some of those home, right? I need to note to um, a fellow Rotarian, a friend of yours, whatever. Um, and this week was very timely. A old friend of mine from the National Weather Service sent me, and he's so good about sending handwritten notes. And he sent me one all about his rotary connections. It's not a Rotarian that he's been following what we do in Raleigh Rotary. And I did not know this. So you'll see a picture up there. And my friend is, if you look over on the side screen, he's the tall one at the back of glasses. Apparently, in Rotary, and I don't know if they still do this, they have um, some baseball leagues that they um, have founded and run. And he kind of let me know that his baseball league won their championship 13 to 1. Um, this, I'm sorry for all this wouldn't mean anything to me these statistics. And he also wanted me to know that he had a point say three four batting average. Is that good? Okay. So anyway, it just it meant a lot that he sent me this um, note 
with all his rotary connections. His mom was um, secretary for the district governor, and then this copy was his back there. So send it out to somebody that's weak and just tell them how they've impacted your life. Nosy neighbors. Nosy neighbors. Nosy neighbors. Time and um, that is like we're seeing that he's very nosy. I had to do it. Um, and I call me, and they even Richard Johnson are going to join us for this segment. Hey guys, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, Richard Johnson is today's deputy neighbor. We're not going to our next neighbor segment. It's just the idea that we're pulling somebody out that you might not have been pulled out. If you want to come to the club, we sit together, we hang out, we have lunch. We don't get to know everybody every time. It's a big club, so it's our opportunity to dive a little deeper with one person. And uh, hopefully that train will come by and hear our thing. Here, I'll switch it with you. Go, okay. So, Richard. Yeah, you guys hear Richard okay? Yes. Richard, if you don't mind starting, can you just tell us a little bit professionally? Where do you go during the week, Monday and Friday? What kind of work do you do? Uh, what kind of clients do you serve? Okay. Um, for 22 years, I've been in the nonprofit space, so I've basically been a fundraiser for food volunteers. But currently, I'm working for how the director of research development for Southeast Raleigh Farms. Now, uh, mission is to help all the residents of Southeast Raleigh and the different areas, which is how they entail education and economic mobility. Awesome. Great mission. That. How about could you tell the club a little bit about your youth, where you grew up, where you went to school, a little bit about you before you were big? <laughs> well, some people say I'm still not big. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm originally from Raleigh, graduated from Yellow, and I've got a September in the year of 2002. I tried to do a business with my professional point out in the Newport News for getting my annual chair. And uh, I'm a past president of the Newport News City Center Lottery Club. And I moved up to Salt there in Maryland and worked out of the park. I was in the Delaware, up in that area. Um, that was all in my career. I was a Boy Scout for 50 years of Boy Scouts before we got back to the area in 2019. Were you a scout? No, I was not a scout. <laughs> I was in scout. Well, I was in scout for like two, three years. It was a jumpstart. We got away from it. But then I was uh, visiting a friend in Richmond, Virginia. And while I was there, I got graduated from college. He said, Richmond, we're going to have a wish out camp uh, for the sun. And, and all the relationships, and I have a business degree, so I just imagine you can't hear me every one of the doing something like that. But I said, okay, I'll, I'll look at the wish out camp. Great. So we want you to be out watching. <laughs> that was the last thing on my mind, but through that summer, I was just kind of learning about, um, you know, just the impression that Scout makes on the kid and, and also the parents and the adults. That's how they get on the kid. Awesome. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your family, who's in your family, maybe a favorite story about a family member? Okay. Um, um, and I'm going to be married 17 years to my lovely wife, Melody. We have an eight year old named Malcolm. Some of you have, may have never had a meeting or two. And we have a three year old daughter named Lauren Marie. She just turned kind of three July the first. Um, not necessarily a funny story about a family member, but uh, my dad one of 15, so I have to teach me first cousins. <laughs> In summary, we love the community long service at Richard. If you want to have 50 first cousins, see Richard. See Richard. Thank you, Richard and Tommy. So Frank McNally, or Happy Wilders, last evening from his family reunion. So I thought it was to be Wilder, but the Happy Family reunion or the um, Johnson family reunion. And it's going to be pretty tough on the Happy Family. Hopefully fun. All right, this is Tommy, you're back. Frank McNally. Hey, for those of you, for those of you that do participate in the raffle, thank you for participating in the raffle. Your slow and steady participation helps the club to earn money all year long. We put that money towards all the things that we do. So if you have a ticket today, 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, Patty and Robin Clemson have a very special presentation. Um, today I'm actually on my I'm wearing a very uh, special pen. Um, and it's really quite small, so I put a picture of it up on the screen. Does anyone know what it is? It's actually a four hundred dollar pen. It's uh, in, in the lingo in the lingo of the country, it's called a fuzzy. It was one of the original pens given to me by uh, a member's a member's widow when he died in about eighty seven. Um, and she gave this to me when I played president of my club in Rome, Pennsylvania. Uh, so we did a very special thing. There were very few of these spot that around. Well, I sold on the eBay recently for 180 bucks. Uh, that's what they're going for. So um, I chose to wear it today and I chose to wear it today because it reminds me the fact that although we're going to have a little bit today, the contribution of the Georgia Foundation, the whole house of the spine. The understanding is that we don't do this alone. We simply are building a work that we can do some long reports. This member who received this original four hours of um, was one of the beginners of the foundation, and now has billions of dollars in it because we've chosen to stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. We support this foundation is so important to our work in the world and the natural. We're very pleased today to have our husband. The four hours follow spy, and you can now have six thousand dollars plus another, and we're very grateful to recognize her for contribution and her support for the international to our foundation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patty and Robin. And Robin, thank you so much for your generosity. That is quite a milestone, PHF plus five. Okay, service time. I believe we've got a tag team again this week. We've got Richard and Kevin's going to report on our habitat normal. We got a picture. I do. Okay, Steve, you so I have a team of 10. I can speak louder. I had a team of 10 folks, five, ro five Rotarians, and, uh, and then you see the whole group in uh, City Club members. So it's a great group. And I, uh, we're trying to finish some houses out there. So we're at the, the final stage. That's one of the houses. Uh, there's 13 that are almost finished. I asked them all, I said, how many of you have painted or caulked before? And nobody raised their hand. So, but I'll tell you, and I've been saying this every time I get up here, by the end of the day, None of them will ever pay somebody to talk or paint their house. And they learned how to do it. They did a great job and had a blast. And the good news was we were inside the house so it'd be out in the sun and then, you know, the really hot weather. So it's a great time. I promise you, if you come out, you will learn a new skill and you will take it for the rest of your life. So great job. Here you think you're coming out. Thank you, Kevin. And we'll have one more on my habitat project in our service here. And I think Gary uh, mentioned this. Kevin puts it on a YouTube. Yes. He had a second career here. You could do this. Uh, so uh, thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, so, uh, August service project is our stream cleanup at Lions Park. Thank you, President Tom. We have uh, adopted a stretch of a stream at Lions Park. And we'll be doing our cleanup, which we do twice a year, uh, August 19th. 
from 9 a.m. to 12. This is a family friendly event, and we're going to ask for 20 Rotarians to help us accomplish this. This is one of my uh, personally one of my favorite events because it's very impactful, um, it's still very tangible. Because as you can see, um, we collect quite a quite a bit of trash. So um, all you need is uh, I'll have a trash bag, and vest, and just three hours of your time. And, We'll knock it out before it's really hot. So uh, there will be a link that will go out next week's newsletter to sign up. Again, it's a family friendly event. So I encourage you to come out and uh, help us do some good. Um, we also may have an additional project thanks to Tara Reeves uh, in our partnership with um, Dix Park. I'll have some more information on that next week. That'll be kind of a supplementary project to August along that account. And um, and then we'll start talking about September. Uh, let's off to a good start this year. Thank you very much for your service, and I appreciate the privilege. Of Thank you, Richard and Kevin. Um, we're off to a great start with service with the Habitat Bill and two very exciting projects for August. Okay, so for a very special presentation today, our first impression of the year, Mr. Christopher Burner, President nominee. Thanks, Gary. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. For those who don't know me, my name is Eric Turner. I'm the membership chair for the Rotary Club of Raleigh. So we're grateful and thankful that you all are here. Uh, I'm so happy to see you already have a nice hat. And that will take us to the side to see that. Um, and and as Carrie's point is, we do have a special uh, induction today. It's the first induction of the year. Uh, and they're running each other here. It's going to be safe. So, Carrie, as well as Tiffany, and Eric. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, we're really excited today to be adding Eric to the Rotary Club Frog family. Uh, uh, so Eric's membership application has been reviewed in accordance with our club's constitution and bylaws. We will now proceed in the mini view and significant drawing of the Rotary Club Broadway and the friendship of Rotary throughout the world. Uh, but first, we have a few questions. Question one. Here, if you join us and subscribe to the video, like it so it's Question number two. Will you join us in our activities for service projects and fundraising activities in support of our community? And will you join us in supporting Rotary efforts worldwide to focus on seven areas, promoting peace, disease prevention, providing clean water and sanitation, maternal and child health, basic education, literacy, economic community, protecting the environment. Uh, and fellow Rotarians, will you join in fostering and supporting Eric as he joins us in pursuit, uh, pursuit of adding value for the community who service above self? So, can you say, I don't know. Okay. Now, that's the positivity. If you can provide some good things at all, we can wear that for pride in the communities. And, Rotary Club Club, would you please join me in welcoming the other Aaron to the Rotary Club Club? Uh, next, uh, the main one, the ship one, and then show me how our service social, our first one of this uh, calendar year, um, and it shows the love for one of the hosts. We're going to have the service social here on July 26th, which is actually a Wednesday night. So, Wednesday, July 26th, here from 5 to 7. If you haven't had an opportunity to walk around here, they have a whole bunch of uh, games and arcade stuff in the back, a darts, pool, and all that stuff. So, you want to come out and get beautiful, just come just come to me after me. Um, uh, the usual what we do too is we uh, usually collect uh, uh, uh snacks and foods for uh, 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 local uh, middle school like that. Uh, we're, we're going to do a little bit of a switch actually in case a uh, connection you have in this shirt they're doing backpack buddies, uh, so they're getting school supplies for uh, we have them here. Uh, so for this uh, service social. We're going to actually be collecting school supplies, so colored pencils, pencils, things like that. We'll have a full list that we'll send out uh, to the Rotary Group. So make sure to come out and support our hosts here, uh, get to know each other a little bit better, as well as some support our little schools. Uh, Sign that. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Harrison. And Eric, welcome to the Rotary Club of Raleigh. Excited to have you with the number. Birthdays and anniversaries. We have Chris Jones on the 21st, um, Sky Madrid on the 23rd, and Candace Laughing House on the on the 23rd. Um, happy birthday to all of you who are going on Zoom. Happy birthday. Uh, no anniversaries this week. I guess we're telling it's just too hot in the summer. The July weddings are not very popular. I think, Jim, you have an anniversary last week, though, right? Wow. Or that's still okay. <laughs> Happy belated anniversary. And with that, it is a great honor to be able to introduce this week's speaker. Dr. Reardon, who's going to talk to us about his book, um, The First Winter at Banda Station, Antarctica. Al Reardon retired in 2006 from North Carolina State University, where for 29 years he enjoyed teaching courses and brought the meteorology curriculum. His research included a broad area, including air pollution, biometeorology, and the analysis and forecasting of winter storms. After a tornado struck Raleigh in 1988, Al coordinated a research consortium of four universities to study conditions that cause tornado outbreaks in the Southeast US. And in collaboration with forecasters at the National Weather Service in Raleigh, he provided support during the severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. Working further with the NWS Raleigh office, he helped develop a collaborative link between forecasters and the research community at NCSU to develop tools to improve winter weather forecasting. Since retirement, Al has worked for his church and the local faith community to combat hunger largely through urban ministries of Wake County and the annual crop walk. Starting in 2017, he ended with the onset of COVID and ending with the onset of COVID. He taught English, provided transportation, and enjoyed friendship with refugees from Africa and Asia, most memorably from Myanmar and Afghanistan. Al also has enjoyed hiking, traveling, portrait drawing, and most recently, a book writing, an endeavor from which he is still recovering. He lives in Raleigh with his sweetheart. He married in 1970 after returning from the Antarctic. They have one son and one granddaughter. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ali Reardon, author, explorer, professor of sciences, and community servant up to the podium. Yeah, this is the tribe's name. It's fine. It'll be the first history. Uh, let's see. This is the, the first winter at Vanda Station, Antarctica. I want to give you a glimpse of what it was like to spend the winter. That's what the book is about. What was it like to spend the winter there? For me, at least. Um, I wrote the Simon Cutfield. You'll meet him in a minute. Next. You want me to do okay. I'll see if I can do this. Two things at once. Uh, Antarctica is at the bottom of the world, first of all. All the blue that you see there, almost all of that is really white because the ocean is also frozen. Uh, but that's the problem. Most of Antarctica looks like this. You don't see a whole lot. It's not very scenic. It's just flat and white. Um, some places are more scenic. Some places are beautiful, but there's a lot of snow. <laughs> if you go anywhere in Antarctica, you've got to move your hotel to leave. That's what that is. Antarctica is uh, that continent, now it's got a lot of stuff upside down on it because this is a, a map that was made in England. Everyone wants to put their country at the top of the map because you want to go down. We go down south, right? Everybody goes down south. This is, we, we go from New Zealand, though, for our trip, because the US base at McMurdo and the New Zealand base in Scott are the main bases for that section of Antarctica. Ships can go that far south. That's the part of south that can go with the ship in any part of the country. So it's a good spot. We're going to fly down there. Uh, February 1969. 
itinerary. This is a super constellation, the C120. It can go as far as Washington and Alameda, California, is jet fuel. Then it goes to Honolulu, makes a stop. Bangle, Bangle, makes a stop. Finally, we get to Christchurch. Christchurch is the jumping off place. Here, here we are, about to be going in our This is our plane, the Pegasus, super constellation, C120 Pegasus. That's our group going down. Not the group I was with, they were groups that were going to all different places to make more of them. Uh, there's a slight hitch in this thing. I'd say the super constellation could go from Washington to uh, California. It can go from Christchurch to the same to McMurdo. There's not enough fuel to go back. The weather is bad. So you've got to keep going. So it acts as the point of no return. The pilot radios ahead and says, how's the weather down? And if it's okay, then continue. The weather turns bad, they have to continue anyway. So this is what happened. <laughs> That's our thing. This is the next one. So I got all the way. <laughs> this is this is really more clammy's on us in this whole thing. Um, here's our flight down to Scott Base with Virgo, and from there we'll be flying over to the dry valleys that man is there. One thing you notice is very different. Bare ground. One of the few places there's bare ground. There's a river that flows from the coast into the lake and an inland. And uh, it's been that way for the last two to five billion years. New York State has been flaking even more than this place. There we are in the right valley. That's a satellite picture of it. The red dot is up on the side where it climbed up on the time to look west at that giant East Antarctic ice sheet, that permanent ice. It's been there forever. Here we look at it, and uh, you see ice in the background right on the horizon. That's the East Antarctic ice sheet. Thousands and thousands of square miles of just white. Hardly anybody's ever been there, except maybe the frogs did. <laughs> There's a rock dam there that is just high enough to keep the ice out of the that East Antarctic ice sheet has never been high enough to go down into the valley for two to five million years. There's an ice covered lake where we were sitting next to our station, Lake Banda. There it is. You see the ice there 10 to 12 feet of ice, thick, permanent on that ice. But the water temperature at the bottom of the lake is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Benefacts. This is because the glacier never touched this place. These rocks are millions of years old. They've been sitting there. This is Mr. Moon. <laughs> so, um, the one on the left is Simon. I told him you can wait there as long as you want Simon, but the bus service here is terrible. <laughs> Whoops, what happened? Let's see. Again, I'm going to this. I'll sit through this. There we are, looks These are some of the rocks. We call this one the mushroom. That has been eroded by flowing sand along the surface for a million years. It's it's weird. It's the weirdest place you'll ever want to go. The next one here is an auto junkyard, a chemical weather plant. This one looks like a dinosaur. It looks like we're on Mars. Except it's not red. We have mummified seals too. Up to 50 miles inland. I've seen seals. I don't think they walk very well on Mars. There they are, all over the place, found in there. Nobody knows why. They're all going west, away from the ocean, toward 50 miles. We didn't actually study them, but we did something on the top. Lake Vanda. There it is again. Can you see the station? It's down on the left, some tip of the lake. Well, if you look at it carefully, and you know the left, you see, there it is. We are very small. We're there for a big time. It's a big 
being blessed. That's the cake. I'll tell you more about it. There's a group of us, <laughs> four New Zealanders and one of them. Simon is on the left there. Simon, the science guy, he did all the science except for the weather. Bill is in the middle of the back there. He's a real, very veteran, one of the veteran uh, Antarctic explorer. He's been down there many times. Warren on the right, oops. Warren on the right is our big baby. He's the one who kept us alive. Uh, the generator's running and so forth. Ron is the fellow on the left in the front. He's the other meteorologist. The two of us were 12 hour shifts, weather around the clock. And I uh, other stuff going on there. What we had, we had a tractor. That's a Ferguson farm tractor with metal tracks. So it drives like a tank over rocks and peaks. It got us across the lake, as you'll see. This is the map, the green wheel we use a lot, powered by gas and energy. Purpose of the winter. Why was there no snow? Why doesn't there fill up with snow? It snows every day. Did the lake stay warm? Some thought it was solar heated, that made me cool off. Some thought it was geothermally heated, that made me stay warm. So we established Daniel's record of weather. Um, Ron and I were the meteorology. Of course, Simon did all the rest. Hydrology, all the lake measurements, uh, seismic measurements, ionosphere studies, who the busy the guy. There's the station as it sees. You can see the layout. Standing on the lake, looking south toward the station, there's a new quarter. This is the food storage about full of cans, food, and thousands of candy bars. Um, the meat was kept frozen under the, under the main hut. Even outside, nothing but a pumpkin. Um, lab, that's where we spent time with our data analysis. And then a refuge hut. There's no way out. The hut burns down, you gotta have something to go. So that's where we had a red and shut with boats and supplies and his hut burns down, which was the biggest pain in town. Challenges, ice plate, last, last plane February, first plane of October, no human contact for eight months. Five strangers living together, no chance of air rescue. Bill had a crash course in surgical science. He had a big box of surgical tools. In case your appendix is bad, we, we kept things to ourselves a lot. Um, no chance of errors. Limited communications. We had a single sideband radio to talk to one other state. Uh, darkness, four months continual darkness. But, you know, we had supply of the US. Uh, that was the US uh, Navy at that time. Uh, all kinds of resupply, they brought all kinds of things in when, when the daylight was there. It was vast and reliable most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last job, last job for uh, less than after it. That's a rock of there. Not much privacy, but what a beauty. It really <laughs> um, and that's our that's our fuel depot. Uh, these are the fuel part of that is a cut of gel and uh, oil and gas. But it didn't have all our equipment. The, uh, the equipment wasn't all there. We were missing some science equipment on the helicopter. So first rescue helicopter came over from the ship where we're still sitting on this equipment and brought it over the shoreline and and uh, this was our easier journey. This was our first big adventure. It would have been a dull time, but stuff keeps going wrong. And that was when it made the book possible and made it interesting. Uh, Bill Warren and I were going to match and had to go down and pour the stuff on the night of March. We went down the valley, stayed at that blue dot hotel there, and then across the glacier to get the stuff in the back. Uh, first, we have to park on the tractor because it's really cold. The engine block has to be warmed up. That's the kind of stuff they use at the end of the And the planes have to be warmed up. That there, it burns gas like the running, like it's running out of style. Like it's going out of style. There it is. There's the tractor on the tarp, the heater, trying to heat it up. Start. 
Uh, there's Warren and I, for some reason, I was going to play that. I don't mind that. You know, it's, it's, it's warm if you're walking. You can get warm anywhere you want. And what the vehicle is in, no, it is not good. The exits where the inn was when you stayed, it was uh, minus 29 degrees, and I call this best of the park. Um, the inn was, uh, you can fly the box, don't eat, just four bumps at the table. And uh, and it was in worse shape after we left, actually. I could give it a half star, but half star. <laughs> That's how it goes in the spring when we arrive at We had to get up on the glacier with the tractor. But oh, that's it. But Bill knew a way, this is the way they could get down. Scott Bates, when they built the station, they found this way down. And so we reached the tractor off the glacier with the cable. Um, there we are. The cable, uh, there's the cable. You see it wrapped around that piece of stone. We got up there. Oh, uh, Warren calls it Spot the Yank. Spot the Yank. That's me up there. Uh, this is where they came across. This is the group that came across the builder station six months before Scott Pace. Notice they got their hotel in there. They had some trouble coming across. Uh, they almost lost two vehicles in the grasses. And we're going to cross there. So Bill called the living mast. <laughs> I, I stood on the back of that cabin with some gear, a sort of skier. It was great. And Warren and Bill were able to fit themselves on the track to get across. Coming back was about a pound of sled and put all the stuff on it that we've been coming for. And that's me on the back of the sled. Home. Science. There was science. Simon was out on the lake measuring stuff all the time. Lake levels, lake ablation. Uh, lake levels were done uh, partly by Bill. He uh, had survey equipment, and Simon spent hours and hours filling those in the lake. Well, we advice, and it's like concrete when it's that cold. He had three or four different drills. The only one that really worked well was the simply hand drill that you see there. Gets in my new of his life using an ice axe and a drill to get down to the water to measure the lake level or to measure the temperature. I have my fantasy. I just have to go out and measure the uh, temperature out of the instrument shelter every three hours. And uh, one of the things is Ron went out and I, he took the night shift, although it didn't make much difference after a while. <laughs> there it is doing the uh in the lab doing the uh rewarding of data the rewarding data we spent a lot of time measuring the rewarding data writing things down by hand there i am i had stations around the valley to measure wind speed on the left and wind direction on the right big battery box battery and over I was pretty ambitious. I had four of these all over the place. Only one of them survived the year. The batteries all froze. I had 200 amp hour truck battery in the So we developed the web way of carrying a running generator on my back because you couldn't start it. You're not going to call it. You go on the corner and it's done. It doesn't attract your degree. So I carried it on my back on my leg. And this is my clip in the meter. Go out to that station and charge the battery and leave the generator, and then go back the next day to pick up the generator and bring it back. It kept you fit. It also kept you warm. We could stay warm from that. It really could. It didn't matter how cold it was. Coats off, mittens are off, getting up to that generator, that uh, battery pack. I would spend it. So uh, it was one of the two times that we went. Winter came. The sun was down. No one had ever been there before. They didn't know what to expect. They moved the mountains sometimes. They walk around. Whoops. Life with them. One problem we had down here was that the uh, cables that held the building down and everything were sometimes not needed. Wind generator didn't turn because it was building. Then it got cold and calm. 
because it is. So we had to run gas and generators all the time. The generators were five of them bought for $15. They were junk. They burned oil as much as they burned gas and eventually broke it. They ran out of gas. So I had to depend on the sun. <laughs> That's the one we were sitting there. We had a meeting with our with our police on time. Uh, share housework. Why do you think we had to do everything? They didn't give us a book. So we were having bills of menus for the back of the Reader's Digest and uh, magazines and back boxes of things. Uh as our stove, which wasn't really up to the task of keeping the place sometimes. Well, we had hobbies. I had things to do. Uh, we could read. Um, go on picnics. That's what we know about. That's what we have to do. In the summer, it was a problem. And you got guests from all over the world coming in for dinner or whatever. And then you want to do that. Gathering ice for water. To get a bath, to get any water, we cut ice from the lake. And Herman the Ice was very rough, but there was a place out there where there was some kind of shelves where you could cut the place. It was great, big blocks of ice. Almost ready to do. We could build the ice pile on the way. I could build the ice building with those and be up there throwing ice at the ice belter. Stole and melted ice, and then you have one. Uh, we had a woman though, so uh, you could have had to the same, but you have to, it had to do with right? Temperature extremes. Here's some of the results of what we measured. Daytime, remember in the southern hemisphere, so uh, the dates are January through December. Winter is in the middle of summer out here. They're in the middle of winter right now. The dark, dark part of the year is from late April to late August. And you can see the temperatures is very differently. In the daytime, on the left and right, you see minimum temperature and maximum for every day, minimum maximum temperature like you do here. Uh, the sun got lower in the sky there when we had one of the mountains at about midnight, and then it came up and was brighter during the daytime. So we went from 10 degrees centigrade, almost 50, that's almost 50 degrees above zero. And then it went down below freezing, zero is freezing centigrade. You know, the book was published in New Zealand. We had it measured. Everything was measured. So, you know, anyway, the whole thing was measured except for the US. Anyway, zero is freezing. And so it went down towards the February, getting down to about 14 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was chilly. But that daytime was kind of like going to go on the moon. Kind of like going to go on the moon. But in the books, <laughs> If the high school is, you know, minus, it goes from, from minus 70, minus 70, 70 down to the bottom of July, and way more, well, or maybe 15, 18 degrees in the winter. But it's not so cold. Thanks. Under the bumps, looking up to our friend inside the room, lying inside the prison. The people have started to do this one of them. This is our uh, Simon's uh, supplies, how many supplies are we used to use for the program? Walk outside, acting this looks worse than it is. You're warm when you're outside, but your breath freezes and it freezes about everything. So it takes you half an hour to get your coat off on your star toys. They're all stuck to you. <laughs> if you have a beer, they have no beer here in your bench. Uh, you got to be real careful you don't stick your tongue out. Because guess what happens? <laughs> it sticks. <laughs> you learn that a little bit. And it, it looks worse than it is. Actually, the uh, worst part of this was the isolation in the garden, not the temperature. Temperature, even in the building, standard isolation was hard. Um, when it got warm, back birthday parties, that's me with the fire extinguisher. Uh, 
party. With Midwinter Day, we had a big party. Bill made that cake from the recipe got somewhere. It weighed 14 pounds. <laughs> Games after dinner, checkers, chess. We discovered Monopoly. Nobody played cards like Monopoly. It was great, but it would take a long time. <laughs> Summer, Adam Beaver, however, said in the camera, you can read about it in the book. The lighthouse work. We heard people were coming in soon, so we thought we'd better spin me up again with an ice axe. First outside contact, October 18th, came in with the We were a little shy. We, we first thought the helicopter was the crewman. With his camera, Bill is walking out, but we were too shy to walk out the way. And on the helicopter were a bunch of people, including a psychologist. He wanted to see the effect of isolation on the small rooms. We wanted to get to it before we were going to it. We had a show already. These are two guys from uh, Blaze Gauntlet. People arrived with all the time. It was great all over the world. These guys were from Italy, place galleries. The one on the left is allegedly the one who was able to lift our table from off the floor with his team. We we were able to travel more now. We had gas heat and everything back. So we had transportation coming in, helicopters. So we we're going on the nap down to visit one of those glaciers. Simon told me, Al, can you get some snow from the top of the glacier and from the bottom? They're doing um, uh, studies of the age of the lake, radio isotope studies. There's a guy in Chicago, the scientist there, wants those, those uh, samples. Okay, sure. So we broke down and I began to wonder how this was going to work. There's the glacier. Oh, God. Well, fortunately, there was a ladder. And I would have their several attempts, they would have to climb up there and get the guys for assignment. Um, and then have them. Well, that's almost out of time on many time for questions. I just want to leave you with some pretty pictures of places that no one has ever seen. 13 people have been built in there on the only American. The lake flooded. It flooded the whole area. They closed it all down. They moved out, and no one has ever been there since, except in the summer. But no one's been there in the winter or our season. See those sunsets, see the wildness of it. It was a once in a lifetime. There's a group, uh, Bill on the left, Simon, me, Warren, Ron, and of course, Dallas down, down there. That was the after the winter. We all grew and we changed by this experience. You don't really know what you, what you can do until you're forced to do it. <laughs> That's me before and after. Look at what This is the second coat. I had two coats. I destroyed the first one. That's the one I'm wearing here. The second one is, uh, looks pretty bad. I got a screw. So that's the end. Uh, oh, yeah, he did a good place. That was the way to work on Simon's chemicals. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't have copies here, but uh, I kept the sheet of paper which will tell you, you know, how to get it more about it. Um, and uh, that's all. Um, it was the end of uh, the story, but really just the beginning for me. Thanks. Any questions, please? How far is that south? Uh, we were at 77 south, 78 south. A good ways. If it's 111 kilometers per degree, do the math. It is it's far. Antarctic is pretty big. Um, yeah. How is global warming impacted? Uh, you know, we've probably seen that a lot of the glaciers on the anything touching the ocean seem to be melting. Um, around the ice shelves, um, some of the um, but inland, they haven't found very much at all. They're starting to now see some evidence of 
of reduction of ice height near the coast in an enlarged East Antarctic ice sheet, but not much. The lake flooded, however. Temperature will not tell you anything at random because whenever the temperature was up, it was because it was windy. The air would come down off the East Antarctic Plateau, very cold, coldest air in the world, down and heats up because it's coming down. It dries out and blows the snow away. It falls in because of the snow. That's all, which is about this much water for the year. And it all gets that laden and blown away by the dry wind. And it can't snow, it starts to dry. It can fall some fall, but it doesn't be because we're lower. Ironically, we're lower than the sheep. But you can't tell the temperature change from the temperature there was global warming because if we had two more windy days, who would raise the annual temperature every year? Because it was so warm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
they are less likely to They did a nice job in Canterbury Press in Christchurch, published it. It's a big deal for the New Zealanders because it was their own, the only base they've ever had. On the other base is Scott base on the uh, it ends. I mean, but New Zealand very proud of that army, but they didn't bother work. If they, in fact, they have a post office there, they kind of think of it as part of the edge. We don't have landlines there. So international, I mean, the Antarctica is an sort of international research park. There are countries that kind of have their peace. Um, so uh, it made a lot of that. I think the book went Well, thank you so much, Dr. Reed. We have a little gift for you. Um, but it's not interrupted, so I really would try to take it out and do some interest here tonight. But it has a four week list on the back, and so we'll get it over. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Rotarians, can you please rise with me for the four way test? And the things we think, say, and do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build with them and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Maybe there's a term. Make sure you have to talk to the that we have more questions for you on the Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.